Here we're videoing Jupiter, uh, four of the Galilean moons as well. A larger telescope, um, steady, obviously, and needed. And you can see the relative position of the Galilean moons here. Sometimes it'll be a place we can see all of the moons. But Roma used the position of these moons to calculate the value of the speed of light by carefully noting the times that the moons took to orbit the planet, which itself, as you can see from this, is not a perfect sphere. He found that the orbiting times varied according to... Here you can see the uh, Galilean moons, Jupiter. Roma noted that the times that the moons took to orbit the gas giant varied according to the position of the Earth around the Sun and rightly surmised that the difference was due to the extra distance that light had to travel when the Earth was on the other side of its orbit from a position six months previous. Of course if you do want to uh, start with uh, astronomy, one of the best things to do is use binoculars. A pair of 10x50s or a pair of 12x50s as I've got on a clear star and out like this. The only way around the sky first before you're moving on to the big boys. This is the big boy. These can be got hold of very inexpensively now because as you can see there are, they are a leviathan, not very portable. And I've had to clean the mirror on this one and I've uh, polished it again myself, taking quite a risk. It's quite an old scope, and, uh, but it still works. We'll have a look at Jupiter in a second, okay? Videoing Jupiter, you can see there's two of the Galilean moons very close to the disk of Jupiter, fainter one about there, further out, so it's one, two, three, four. Sometimes a low res resolution is better catching things like this. Bring it back, slightly out of focus. If you're lucky, you sometimes see the bands. There you go, slightly high magnification, harder to keep it steady. You can certainly see those two Galilean moons a lot better, closer to the disk. The planet, take it up higher. You can see the separation between the moons, moons better at higher magnification, although the resolution is a lot poorer. Slightly higher magnification, just to see if I can see anything on the actual disk of Jupiter itself. Certainly make out three of the Galilean moons. Hello Star Watchers, we've made it to Lesson 8. How about that? Well, I picked up this very cheap camera. It's uh, only 2 megapixels, cam media, but it's got ISO 800 on it. Being me, I couldn't wait to try it out. My first thing would be to let's have a look at something called the Beehive Cluster. Now, the trouble is the Beehive Cluster, if we look at the sky up there, it's bright up there. telescope here, I've got the Beehive Cluster, which is a beautiful sight in the heavens. Praesepi is its name as well. But in order to see the cluster, what I've decided to do is set this camera here onto ISO 800 at a 13 second, let's try a 16 second exposure at f4, and see if it'll capture the cluster. So I put the camera right to the eyepiece of the camera, of the telescope, press the shutter once and let it focus 
and then let's see if it'll take the picture. If it won't, I'll have to press it again. There we go, it's rolling, Jane, isn't it? Is it still red light or has it stopped? Let's see what we've got. We'll press this little button twice. Right, well, it may have picked up some of the stars. I'd have to look at it in more detail, but tiny little dots. And there's like a knot in the middle of the screen there. And um, the Beehive Cluster is a sort of a... There is a sort of a reddish tint to the sky in general now I'm looking at it, but I'd have to look at this in more detail. This is the first time I've used this, this type of, for eyepiece photography. You've seen me use it on the tripod which is no problem at all. I'll be fetching that in a minute. Okay, that'll do, thank you. Good evening astronomers, lesson 8. Welcome aboard. Here we're going to have a look at Jupiter, the gas giant. This planet being so large that even the most prominent feature on it, that is the giant red spot, could swallow up planet Earth two and a half times over. Now that is big. This planet orbits the Sun, here situated in my centre of my diagram, 11.9 Earth years it takes to go once around. Compared to us, we just take the one Earth year, of course, to go around once around the Sun. The distance of Jupiter from the Sun, 778 million kilometres on average. Our distance from the Sun, by comparison, coming out as 150 million kilometres. Now, all very interesting. However, the interesting bits about Jupiter are 1610, the Italian Galileo discovers it has moons, four of them prominently observable through even binoculars these days, but he had a crude telescope noticing that the positions of the moons around the gas giant changed. The four moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, all very interesting, however, it becomes more exciting when you realise that the planet, like other planets, throws a shadow. So when the sunlight hits Jupiter here, represented here, there's a shadow thrown into space. You can observe how long it takes these moons to go around their parent planet by timing how long it takes for the innermost one, say Io, to go from a point where it just goes into the shadow cast by the parent planet, then back round again in front of the disk of Jupiter and then back to the shadow. Also, astronomers note that when the moon passes in front of the planet, as long as the angles from your observing on Earth are correct, you may see a little spot on the uh, disk of the gas giant, that's the shadow of the moon as it crosses the planet. Oh! Anyway, my point about these satellites of Jupiter is that they were used to measure a very important uh, property that we now know as the speed of light. Now this was first surmised and tried to be attempted to be measured even by Galileo, but he didn't come anywhere near the accepted value. It was not until 1676 that the Danish astronomer Ole Roma, who was himself measuring how long it took from Io to go from being just eclipsed by the shadow, that's an eclipse where, where the moon is just going into the shadow cast by the gas giant, and then round again to another eclipse point. It was convenient to use Io for measuring these orbital periods because four times the, the, the time it takes to go around, as measured from Earth, comes out as just over seven days. Seven days, one hour, 54 minutes, 23.6 seconds. However, 
even that's not technically correct because you're having to allow for the fact that Earth is moving around the Sun, so is Jupiter moving around the Sun, and also you have to account for the time the delay it takes from light to reach from the point where Io crossed the shadow to the observer on Earth E. Now, if Jupiter happens to be at opposition, that is at a point closest to Earth in its orbit, as it's going around the Sun, you will observe the gas giant to be larger relative in size to when the gas giant is, at, say, at the far a further point of its orbit, say over here, and further away from the Earth. And this was known. And the Earth-centered theory, which was discounted by Galileo, because at, the time, at his time, in 1610, it was believed by um, the authorities that everything rotated around the Earth, including the Sun. This was proved to be wrong. Later on, it was accepted by scientists that the Sun is at the center of our solar system and the planets orbit around it. Now, what Roman noted was that if he timed how long it took Io to go around Jupiter, if he timed how long it took when the Jupiter was over here and he was observing from Earth, say, here, he found it took longer to, for the little moon to go around Jupiter than it did at this point here in the Jupiter's orbit. And he surmised that this was due to the extra distance DE that light had to travel in order to reach his telescope and to see that eclipse of the moon Io. Now, what he did is he, he kept all his calculations and he worked out the difference in the orbital period of Io. What was the greatest difference that he observed? That greatest difference he observed had to be due to this large distance, DE, the extra distance that the light had to travel. So knowing this value DE, which he surmised was nearly equal to the diameter of the Earth, uh, Earth's orbit around the Sun, in other words, it'd be, the diameter would be twice its radius, so twice 150 million kilometers comes out as 300 million kilometers. He worked out that DE was about 0.97 of that distance. You could work out the speed of light by having that distance. Speed equals distance divided by time, basically, as you know from your GCSE, etc. This DE distance divided by the eclipse difference between the eclipse differences of the innermost moon of Jupiter could give him a value for what we call little c. That's the speed of light. So in 1676, Roma, can you believe it? It's just brilliant. Came up with this value for the speed of light of 225,000 kilometers a second. Considering how crude his clocks were at the time, with no digital technology, the value which is accepted today for the speed of light is 299,000. 272 kilometers a second or usually rounded up to 300 kilometers a second or 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters a second so there you go that's a little bit interesting facts few facts about jupiter um, the rotation period of the gas giant itself varies according to latitude um, it's fastest around the equator due to an effect that isaac newton predicted due to its faster rotation on the equator and, but the average rotation period is only 9.8 hours. Earth, as you know, just around, is, is, we call a day 24 hours. But not exactly so, because we have leap years. But that's another subject.